The title of the message is Breaking Down the Barriers, and Jesus loves to break down the barriers. He loves to break them down. We're going to look at this morning the rest of this passage in John chapter 4. Familiar passage to many folks. It's the, the account of when Jesus met with and ministered to the lady at the well. It's sometimes called the Samaritan woman at the well or the woman at the well. Different titles for the same situation. I see in this, this situation some barriers that were up that Jesus knocked down completely. I see some, some situations and some similarities to our life, how Jesus loves to knock down the barriers. Do you know that we want to put up barriers in our life between us and God? There are some people who think that they cannot get saved, they cannot go to heaven because they've been too bad. They've made too many wrong choices. Jesus loves to knock that barrier down. You know, sometimes people think, well, because I don't fit in like those other Christians that I think I am, I can't go to that church. Well, look around this church, a lot of different people here. And I love that. Jesus loves to knock down barriers. We live in a culture, a time, that likes to see about people overcoming things. I'm thinking of a show that was popular for a while called American Ninja Warrior. An American, did you say amen to that, Spencer? He said amen to American Ninja Warrior. Somebody help the man out. I'm about to knock down that but I'm just messing with my friend. And apparently how this show went, they, they would have these obstacles and, and people would train for months or years of their life to overcome these obstacles and they'd make them bigger and harder and, and better. I've watched little snippets sometimes and, and seen these, these men and, and try to just, I mean, they jump on their feet and there's balancing acts and there are strength acts and there's some that look like just pure luck, all right, if you get through this thing. And if they don't make it, all right, there's also this American feeling that we like to sometimes see people fail. Is this true or not? Yeah, this is true. This is true. I, I, I've seen some of these videos of the biggest fails on American Ninja Warrior. They go to jump and hit the wall flat on their face. I know, Miss Chrissy, you like those failing things because I've known Miss Chrissy. She, she's a very compassionate lady, but if someone falls, she, she may chuckle a little bit. I'm guilty as well. I'm with you. I'm with you. And uh, we see these obstacles. We see people fail. Well, you know that, that sometimes we approach our spiritual life the same way? That if I just am a little bit different, if I train a little bit harder, if I work a little bit more, I can get over this obstacle. And, and Jesus comes here to the lady at the well, the woman at the well. He begins to teach her about her spiritual walk. I want to look at this morning, this passage. will not, for sake of time, read the whole passage but we'll read a few verses here and there, and in this passage, uh, we'll look at, starting in John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. I mentioned this last Sunday morning, but Jesus needed to go through that area. It was in the direct route, but most Jews would not walk through Samaria because they hated the Samaritans and vice versa. They would walk around the location, walk around the city, even though it was a shorter path. But Jesus, the Bible says, must needs go through Samaria. I don't believe it was because he wanted to save steps. Maybe you've heard this theory that you only have so many steps in life and then you die. Because after you die, you can't walk any longer. So be careful how many steps you take. Don't try to get 10,000 a day, you'll run out early. All right, not true, just a joke. People talk about that. I don't think Jesus was trying to save steps. I think when the Bible says he must needs go through Samaria, it was because there was a woman there who needed the gospel of Jesus Christ and needed Jesus to interact with her and touch her life and to change not only her life, but the lives of all the people around her in that city. He must needs go through Samaria. We looked at last week that there was a barrier of location. It was a location barrier, and Jesus went there. I'm glad for a church that reaches out across barriers of locations. We don't just try to give the gospel to people who are rich. We don't care if you're rich or you're poor or you're smart or you're not, if you're educated or not. There's not a location that's a problem. We want Jesus to touch your life. And Jesus tore down the barrier of location. You see, another Jew would have avoided that area, but Jesus went right there. He tears down the barrier of location. This morning, with God's help, we'll look at a couple of other barriers that Jesus tears down. Lord, I thank you for your word and for this time. Lord, thank you already for the way you've touched my heart, the service this morning, and the worship. To realize what you've done for me. Lord, I pray that you would help me as I speak to say those things that would be profitable according to your word. Lord, help the people as they listen to be soil that would be representation of who you are and what you have done in our lives. 
Lord, would you speak to us? And if there's anyone here who's not saved, Lord, has never trusted you as their Savior, would they make that decision today? In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. See, Jesus tore down the barrier of location. But not only of location, and I mentioned this briefly last week, but he tore down the barrier of discrimination. We live still in a time that can be racially charged. People don't feel accepted, sometimes because of the color of their skin. And the Bible teaches the exact opposite of that. Can I get an amen? The Bible teaches the exact opposite of discrimination. We see that right here beginning in John chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. And the Bible says this in verse number 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, verse 8 of John chapter 4. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. This lady says, listen, Jesus, to this man. She doesn't know it's Jesus yet. She says, why are you asking me to give you a drink? Because you know and I know that we don't work well together. You know and I know that the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. As I study the history and the, and the time, that it was both directions. All right, not only did the Jews reject the Samaritans, the Samaritans reject the Jews. All right, and it was like this. And yet Jesus broke down the barrier of discrimination. It began way back in the history when the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. And it went beyond into the religious walk. The Samaritans only recognized part of the scriptures. The Jews wouldn't walk through Samaria. They wouldn't acknowledge them. They wouldn't speak to them. Much less would they ask for help, give me a drink. But understand something. Jesus does not distinguish between people. He does not distinguish between people. Oh, you're from America, so I will help you. You're from Canada, so I will not help you. That's the idea. And Jesus is ripping down the barrier of discrimination. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your race is, what your financial status is, what your academic level is, educational level. Jesus wants to break down the barrier of discrimination. There's a man that wrote to a Christian publication. He was a scholar and he said this. He says, as I read the account of the New Testament church, no characteristic stands out more sharply than diversity. Beginning with Pentecost, the Christian church dismantled the barriers of gender, race, and social class. Paul, who as a rabbi gave thanks that he was not born a woman, slave, or Gentile, as a rabbi when he was studying, he would have thanked that way. Afterwards, he said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we're all one in Jesus Christ himself. This man who's from India said this, most of what happens in Christian churches, including even miracles, can be duplicated in Muslim and Hindu congregations. But in one area only, Christians strive, thrive. And they mix men and women, social castes, races, and groups. That's the real miracle. Understand Christianity is an inclusive, an inclusive group. We're glad you're here at First Baptist Church. We don't ask, well, how much do you make a year? We don't care. We have in this room people who are wealthy and some who are struggling. We don't ask, hey, here's an IQ test. Can we find out what your IQ is? Because we have some people who are very intelligent and some of us not so much. We don't ask, well, where do you fit on the, uh, on, on the, on the weight spectrum? All right, are, you, are you fit or are you not fit? We have both those here too. Right? You say, well, how old are you? You know that sometimes a modern church, they, they try to get a certain segment. Now listen, if I could reach all the millionaires in Saginaw, I'd do it. And then I'd preach about tithing for a few weeks. You say, you're just proving you're a Baptist. Yes, I'm a Baptist. But we don't care because Jesus doesn't care. All right, he's, it's inclusive. He, he rips down the barrier of discrimination. 
Jesus takes it and he says, I know what the status quo is between Jews and Samaritans, and I don't care what it is because I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. He rips down the barrier of discrimination. You know, in this church, we also have a difference in age. And I think that's amazing. You can go to some churches, and they will be all one age segment. We went to church once. My wife and I were traveling. Coming back into, towards Saginaw was years ago now. When we got there, we realized that we were the youngest people in the entire church building. We had our youngest son, or our oldest son, Johnny. He was a baby at that time. And they quickly said, well, there's a nursery. We found out that he was the only baby in the nursery and probably the only baby in the nursery for like the last 25 years. All right, though the average age of the congregation was pushing maybe the the level where you get a free coffee at McDonald's. <laughs> Just stating fact. Well, Johnny went to nursery. We almost lost him that day, in fact, because the nursery worker was so helpful that she took him outside, and so we couldn't find him after church. Okay? <laughs> Problem was, my wife was a new mother, new moms. All right? We know new moms. She was a little bit excited when she couldn't find Johnny. Now, that was fine, though. I enjoyed being at that church. I enjoy that. I've been to other churches where the median age was younger than me. All right, and there's almost no one who is in their wisdom in their later years as, as a saint. I love the fact that I look around this auditorium and what do I see? I see young, I see elderly. Outside these walls, down the hallway, I have little children. We have nurseries over there. That's the way a church ought to be, young and old, all together in one place. And these newer churches sometimes want to bring in things. They listen, we just want these people right here. We want the young couples. And I love young couples, but I'm not here to minister just to the young couples. And we want the children. I'm not here just to minister to the children. I'm here to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. And that's what Jesus was doing. You see, really, as a Jew, Jesus shouldn't talk to a woman in public. Try flying that concept in 2019. Whew. Yet Jesus said, I recognize you who are not only a Samaritan, not only a, quote, woman, end quote, I recognize you as someone who needs the gospel. Jesus tears down the barriers of discrimination. But then I see how he tore down the barrier of communication. If you look in verse number 10, plays of John chapter 4, Jesus answered. She just asked him, well, why, do you, why are you even talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with and the well is deep, from whence then hast thou that living water? Now notice something in these next few verses. Jesus has now turned the conversation from the here and the well to the here and the heart. All right, they were talking about a drink of water from the well that she could draw, and now Jesus uses these, these words, living water. He's now turned this conversation to a spiritual sense. All right? He's now talking about her soul, her, her being that will live forever and ever and ever. She wants her to under, he wants her to understand that life is bigger than just this what you see. All right? And that he is the Messiah can guarantee her a home in heaven forever and ever and ever. The living water. So he takes this conversation that was at the well, about the well, and turns it to her heart. And she misses it. She misses it. That's what we read in verse number 11. She said, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. It's like she says, you know, sir, I don't know who you are, and uh, I'm surprised you're talking to me as a Samaritan, but we have a little problem. You offered me a drink. What are you going to do here? You don't have a bucket, sir. This is not a shallow well. It's a deeper well. And, and how are you going to draw the, the water out for me to drink? She asked, verse number 12, art thou greater than our father Jacob? which gave us the well, and drank through of himself and his children and his cattle. Verse number 13, Jesus takes the conversation back to a spiritual plane. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up 
into everlasting life. Now you'd think at this point, she'd get it. He, he, he even mentions everlasting life. There'll be a well of water springing up into him. Like, now this lady's going to get it. All right? The first time she missed it, but this time, he explains it again, this time she's going to get it. Well, look with me, if you would, in verse number 15. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. What's she still talking about? What's she talking about? The well. She's still talking about the well. Jesus has left that topic way back in the distance. He's not talking about the well, and he hasn't been for a little while here. He's trying to break it down for her, and she's missing. Do you see the barrier of communication that, that, that's grown up here? He's talking here, and she's still over here. You know, Jesus wants to tear down that barrier as well, and he does in the next few verses. It takes a little more time, but he tears down that barrier. You understand that there are times as we learn about God, as we read the Bible, we come to church, that at times we also miss the point. We can read this and say, man, woman, what's wrong with you? Do you not get what Jesus is saying? And yet some of us rascals have been here at First Baptist Church for 30 plus years, and we've missed what God was speaking to us. Oh, we heard Pastor Let week in and week out and giving the messages, and, and we sit there and smile and nod and say, oh, that sounds great. We walk out realizing that God was saying this, and we were unfortunately just hearing this. The barrier of communication. You see, we've been here, First Baptist Church, and yet we still miss out on the concept that we're supposed to love God first. Oh, that's not a new concept at First Baptist Church to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's not a new concept here at First Baptist Church, yet, yet we walk out of here and something else is our first love. Sometimes it's a job, sometimes it's a family, an occupation, sometimes it's an activity, a hobby, or, or a thing, an item. You can't be, be here very long and not hear the concept about living for God, abiding in Jesus Christ, and yet we miss it. We miss it. We think abiding in Christ is sitting here Sunday morning. Now, we ought to be here Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, but that doesn't equal abiding in Jesus Christ, walking with him, communicating with him, listening to him. See, we miss in our communication. Christ wants to bring hope for your future, hope for your family, hope for your city. I look at this lady right here at the end of the story, the fast forward to the end, and she's running around the city telling everybody about Jesus. At the end of the story, she gets it. And she's running everywhere she can and saying, listen, come meet the man who told me all things. This is him. This is the Messiah. And she now has a hope. She didn't have a hope before. At this point, she's drawing water about noon. No one, they said, would draw water at noon. It's too hot. Most scholars believe she was at noon because she was an outcast because of her situation. And yet, this whole conversation, she's like, sir, give me this water so I don't have to be an outcast at noon any longer. Give me this water so I don't have to come at noon and, and draw, look, give me this water to, to this gentleman, give me this water so I can be like everybody else. And sometimes we come to God and say, God, give me that so I can do this. You're missing the point. See, they were talking on two different levels. But Jesus always wants us to see the spiritual side. We're not here at church just for a social gathering. We're not here at church just so we can have a good time listening to some good music. We're here because God wants to do something for us on a spiritual level. He wants to touch our hearts on a spiritual level. See, you can't help but wonder that in this auditorium there are barriers their blockages. People who think, I'm not good enough. People who think God isn't good enough, he doesn't care. Jesus wants to tear him down. But the last thing this morning that I see that I'm so thankful for is that Jesus was patient in his communication. Aren't you glad Jesus is patient? Aren't you glad he didn't say, what's wrong with you? Aren't you glad he's a lot more patient than we are? He can say the same thing a few different ways a few different times because he has to to me a whole bunch. And if we're honest, you'd have to say he'd have to to you a whole bunch because like this woman, 
I miss him. And I dare say, if we're going to be honest, you have to say, like that woman, you miss it too. But Jesus wants to tear down the barrier of communication. He wants you to know that he loves you. He wants you to know that he cares about you. He wants you to know that he has a fantastic home, a fantastic future, that he has the answers to all of life's problems. He can patiently tell you that. Back in 1989, they began to tear down one of the most famous barriers of all time, and that was the Berlin Wall. I remember a little bit of that situation. I was only nine years old at the time. Some of you were younger and some older. This year, November 9th was the day they began to tear it down. This year will be the 30th anniversary of them tearing down that wall. I look back at some pictures and I remember some of the news at that time and as a child, some of the snippets. I remember, I don't believe I watched Ronald Reagan say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down, but I remember seeing that play and seeing that iconic phrase and that iconic speech that he made. Studying for this message, I could not help but have some comparisons to the Berlin Wall and what the walls in our life look like. They talked about that Berlin Wall and some of the barriers and, and what it caused to the people on both sides of Berlin, to the calamities, to the problems to the people who tried to escape from the east to the west, and when it collapsed, the joy that was experienced, the people that got to meet fellow Germans on both sides of the same city. I cannot help but correlate that to our life, that when Jesus tears down that wall, that barrier in our life, the joy that happens. There may be a barrier there, but Jesus wants to tear it down. So what's in your life that you think Jesus can't tear down? It's too big, too hard. It could be a situation you built or that he allowed in. Jesus will tear it down. And he'll bring joy and peace and forgiveness. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you that we can come to you but more importantly, you came to us. And while we're yet sinners, you died for us. Lord, you bring salvation. Lord, I pray for the folks here today. Lord, I pray for the ones who maybe have never trusted you as their Savior. Lord, I ask that you would touch their heart today. Would you tear down that barrier, Lord, whatever may be holding them back from accepting you as your Savior? Lord, I pray for the Christians who perhaps have doubted you or are resisting you or are not listening to you in a communication. Lord, tear down those barriers. I wonder who would say this morning, Pastor Howell, with their heads bowed and eyes closed, would you, would you remember me when you pray before the invitation? There's a barrier in my life and, and I, I need Jesus to tear it down. Could be a, a thought, it could be a struggle. Say, Brother Howell, the Lord touched my heart this morning. Would you pray for me? A few moments. Amen. Slip it up, slip it down. Amen. 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 What if there's someone here today who would say, Pastor Howell, as you're speaking, I, I realize that I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I recognize that if I died today, I, I don't know for sure that I'd go to heaven. Wouldn't you pray for the others? Would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me about that? Just slip it up, slip it down. I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. Hey, Amen. I see that hand. Anyone else? Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Lord, you've seen these hands. You know the needs that we have. Lord, we need your grace and your strength. Lord, thank you for your power. Lord, bless this time of invitation. May we be honest and obedient to you in Jesus' name.